Okay, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, yes, um, I'm, I'm, I'm considering whether our talk, our footnotes, at, uh, Peter's talk actually, oh, we'll see. Um, so, oh, uh, how do I go forward? It should be this one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, while I was sitting there, I was thinking how our talk is going to contrast with Peter's talk, and it's just an uh, interesting uh, 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 thing of oppositions. Uh, let's see, let's see how this works. So, uh, what I tend to think actually is that the user interface often actually is uh, treated as a mere by thought, actually, or a mere afterthought of that which is actually considered the scholarly effort or work which is, uh, I think, uh, scholars, scholars would define it, examining and preparing the text and arguing for that prep preparation along scholarly lines. Um, the creation and the evaluation of user interfaces, however, has grown into an academic expertise, as, as we saw yesterday also in Stan, Stan's talk. Um, there are vivid debates on human-computer interaction, graphical design, usability, and so forth, to testify to this. Um, the interface effect that the digital interface exerts on scholarly text has hardly, I think, if at all, been researched. We know almost nothing about what the digital material, materiality look and feel, uh, the structure, the aesthetics, and interac interac interaction affordances of digital scholar uh, scholarly editions mean as to the experience of reading and other uses that these scholarly editions have. Uh, moreover, we do not understand very well, if at all, how these interfaces are part and parcel of the argument we want to convey about the text as textual scholars. We may have tacit knowledge, on this as editors and as readers and as researchers, uh, but there's very little empirical research we can point to, I think. Um, is this the right slide? I think so. I think so, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, we would want to like, we want to contend here that user interfaces are actually a language, a language through which arguments are made even when the makers of these interfaces are not conscious of the language they are using. Uh, as such, they reflect the interpretations of the ma materials they are supposed to represent. They also reflect the culture, the politics, and the motives of their designers. Um, let's consider this example for a moment. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, an, an, an online edition of La Entretenida. I don't even know if I pronounced that correct. Uh, a text by uh, Miguel Cervantes. Uh, it's a digital annotated edition and an English translation, as far as the interface tells me. Um, and we are going to contrast, contrast this to this edition, the digital Thoreau. Um, now, it's a fine line, it's, a, it's walking quite a fine line um, to interpret what we see here, what is happening, what it means, and to what it pertains, uh, what this interface does. Um, do the interfaces express something about the editor's perspective on the digital edition as a concept, or are they foremost about the text? Uh, in effect, is it, is, it, is it a text critical point of view or a methodological point of view, or perhaps a mixture of what is presented to us. Right? Oh. I'm still there? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, in any case, the first interface, so this one of the Antonida, um, uh, conveys, a, I, I think, tries to convey a scholarly perspe uh, perspective, feel, or ID about the text. Uh, the reader is taken pretty quickly to a very dense looking representation of the text with lots of annotations. Uh, the introduction says that the edition's primary aim is to recast, recast or adjust the image of Cervantes to the fact that he was also a playwright, which apparently a lot of people don't know. Um, I didn't, in any case, so don't be ashamed if you didn't either. Um, 
The default is to present the Spanish text with English introduction and paratext. Uh, why is this? This shouldn't necessarily mean anything about the view or the, of the editors on the text or on digital editions. Uh, it could be a sheer funding-related issue, I think. So you see, you see that we are just looking at the interface. The amounts, uh, there arise a lot of questions about why is this interface actually as it is? Why is it looking as it is? What is the editor of this text trying to tell me through this interface about the text? Or is he trying to tell something about his method? Clearly, if we look to the digital throw, um, this, is, this, is, this is a different experience, right? Uh, what we see here is, I think what we see here is that the editor tries to tell us that we there's an experience, there's an aesthetic experience to the text. And he wants, he or she wants this interface to be representative of this and recreating that experience. Uh, although he, he or she is fooling us a little because actually getting to the text in this particular interface uh, is quite hard. And once you get there, um, it turns out to be, again, this dense, scholarly, heavily annotated form of text representation. Um, this is where you take over, I think. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, the useful observation here is that a digital edition's interface is not just an argument about the text. It's also an argument about the attitude of the editor, a window into his or her take on the methodology that he or she has been engaging in, and or on the digital edition itself. And as it happens, as things are now, it is also a revelation of the technical skills available to the editor. This is, some, this is something that can't be got around in some sense. It's an, it's an argument, but it also reflects skills that the editor may or may not have. So the interface tells us something, not only about the methodology, but also about the import of the edition. There's a lot of stylistic communication going on in this thorough edition of exactly the sort of type that we're trying to get at. The argument is made not just through text, but also through colors and mood, layout, graphics. In contrast, the Cervantes edition is not trying to communicate so much this kind of mood. It's clear that these editors would argue that the interface is mostly beside the point. It's a more or less <coughs> neutral technical means to an end. Right, so indeed, Interface development is generally treated as a piece of design independent from the interpretative thrust of the actual content. And so it's considered to lie well within the domains of engineering, interaction design, and aesthetics. These are considered essential to communicate content to the user, but they're also usually considered neutral and non-interfering as being explicitly divorced from the scholarship, from the argument. There is, this this is, comes back to something that Peter said. On the one hand, you have the scholarship and the data. On the other hand, you have this irrelevant interface. Um, so most of you will be familiar with the advice that is usually given to creators of digital editions, that for the sake of sustainability of our research data, we should take care to, center, to separate content from functionality. This is a very good idea for all sorts of reasons when it can be done. Up to now, the database that drives your edition is easier to archive than the website functionality that powers it. And as a result, at the moment, whatever scholarly content is not cleanly separable from your display logic of your edition is likely to remain unarchived and thus be lost sooner or later. But then you're noticing here that again, we are talking as though scholarly content and argument is cleanly separable from display logic and functionality, if only. Yes, uh, I think, I think we think um, that the interface is actually an uh, integral part, inter integral part of uh, the argument. That's why this egg is up here. I mean, you can take an egg and you can separate it, right? And you will be left with all egg white and a broken shell. Uh, but that's not an egg anymore. It's a broken egg. Um, something. Something of this, this metaphor also transfers to digital editions, uh, where we, where we where we can't really experience or judge or critique the edition without taking the interface firmly into account. Um, and this is this, our thinking is based on the fact that, um, that uh, a lot of people before us, a lot of scholars before us have actually argued 
that the, in, the edition itself, the scholarly edition itself, is an argument, right? It's not a text itself, it's an argument about a text. And I think this extends um, uh, to, the, uh, to the digital objects that we are increasingly creating uh, uh, that accompany uh, this digital edition, so the interface as well. Um, and we cannot consider the interface of any edition as some neutral visualization of its argument. We cannot do this because interfaces are constructed objects, uh, just as facts and data are constructed objects. Uh, there's, a, there's a large body of work, uh, primarily by Latour and Wuger, uh, but also Geitelman and Drucker, who argue that you know, there's no such thing as raw or objective data. Data is, the, the very word means given, but actually data is not given, data is created, is constructed, is, uh, is taken. Um, you select data and you judge data and you reproduce data based on the fact that you have an interpretation of an, and an argument about it. And this permeates every pore of your edition, if you're a good scholar, I think. Um, now, many people, many people think that, that data, information, argument can be neutral. Uh, yes, maybe, but usually it will be not, just because we're social and cultural creatures. Um, there has been a lot of research into this, and one of the most striking uh, uh, examples of objects uh, having, may have, <laughs> objects that may have politics, may have argument, uh, are the so-called low bridges of Long Island. Um, there is an argument that these bridges were built so low that at the time, in the early 19th century, 19th century, century thank you, the buses couldn't actually pass those bridges, which to the designer apparently was important because the mainstay of public transportation at the time for black people were buses. And so these buses prevented people from going to the beaches at Long Island, keeping them nicely quiet in that case. This argument has since been turned upside down twice, thrice, and there's great doubt whether this is true. But the fact remains that you can indeed, of course, design stuff, design objects, so that they affect a certain policy, that they affect and exercise control. Uh, Latour has, has another example for example, with the burning key, which is a key that you can, you, you can never forget to lock the door. You know your door is locked if, you, if the key is with you. But it, this also enforces your behavior to how you treat the key. Actually, the, the key is somehow treating you, is, is making you behave in a certain manner. Um, Another example is, very, very heavily contested by the way, is by Tara McPherson, who argued that um, Unix is basically developed in an all-white male environment, and this should make us question how, how this all-white male culture influenced what Unix does and how it operates, and what its affordances are for non-white cultures. Again, very heavily contested and debated research, but very interesting in provoking questions about what does it actually mean that we create stuff? What it is, how do we socially influence it? Uh, and the fact that, just to show that this is not, you know, a mere cipher, that it's essential, um, I can point to Slot Neuschwanstein, uh, which many people, Disney dream of a place like this, um, many people uh, in, uh, took this as a serious medieval castle, but it isn't. It's a 19th century German interpretation, German aristocratic interpretation of what a medieval castle should look like. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is an argument. This is an argument about what a castle is or should be. And exactly the same thing I think we're doing when we're creating our scholarly editions and exactly our interfaces are the representation of that argument. I think this is where I leave. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when we build these interfaces, we generally fail to account for these aspects of interface, and so we often ignore that argumentative aspect of the user interface that we are providing. But there are counterexamples. 
Perhaps the greatest innovation of the digital space is that it gives us a tangible means to express our argument and theory about a text in ways that are not limited to the textual, but also not limited to the static. This isn't entirely about a textual edition, but it's a wonderful example of using interface to make an argument, to make a point. He wants to have these nameless faces. Well, they, they, become, they, they gain their names when you click on a particular individual, but when you first see it, you're confronted by this wall of faces of people who didn't seem to belong in a white Australia, but who had to have papers proving that, in fact, they did. And that was the argument. There's these never-ending people who were discriminated against this way. And this is, this is his interface. This is his argument. Um, so we talk about new forms of expression in digital space all the time. We're always going on about how digital editions give us the, the opportunity to provide new forms of expression. What are we talking about? Let's think about some. We can have, we can have hierarchical or graph models of the text of the edition. We can represent it as running text or as text alternatives or as variant graphs or as tables. We can include images and sound like what we saw yesterday with the Scheherazade edition. Um, that may or may not pertain specifically to a particular word, not to a particular portion of text, it may pertain to the argument that the editor wishes to make about the text and why it's important and why this edition is worthwhile. Um, you have the ability to present these texts, these images, these sounds, either in a static way or in a dynamic way, so that they vary in prominence or even in content according to whatever the editor wishes to emphasize. And all of these choices, all of these decisions made when making your interface not only concern the textual content, but also the entire experience of its context that you're giving to the user who, who comes to your edition. They're determined by and they determine what argument or theory or hypothesis or association the editor has chosen to present. So just as there's not a single data format that will be able to satisfy every use requirement, um, it's hard to imagine that there can ever be one neutral and satisfying interface for a scholarly edition, even if you're using a shared underlying model, even if, even if people have taken two editions and encoded them using the exact same subset of whatever TEI guidelines they've chosen, that doesn't mean that they're going to be served very well by the same edition interface. You have to, you have to think about what argument you're making and what the, what the consequence of your edition work is to decide how best to express that. So we know that any interface has to be developed inevitably in some culturally induced argumentative language. The problem is that we in this field don't really know how this language works yet. We don't really exactly know what we're saying when we're making these interfaces necessarily. Um, we don't know what the properties and the aspects of this design language are. Because this language of argumentative expression through user interface has barely begun its development. But it's safe to assume or conjecture at this point that different arguments and different opinions ought to lead to different interfaces. As soon as we consider our requirements for an interface to the edition, the user requirements and certainly their aesthetics begin to differ and even conflict. And they justifiably should, as these conflicts, in our view, represent various possible arguments about the text. So, while a particular group of, well, this is what I just said actually, while a particular group of scholars may agree, for example, on a particular markup model or a graph-based model as a good representation of a text, the interface preferences of each will be an expression of what they individually intend to do, what argument they intend to make with the model. For instance, the presence and even more the prominence of an interactive collation tool in your interface is linked to the argument that a collation is a changeable thing that should be left to the scholar user to modify and interpret. Or maybe you think the text should be presented in the form of a graph. Um, such an interface relates to the argument that the text constitutes a sort of network, and this network is what should be of interest to the reader or user. Another form might give preeminence to APIs. After all, API stands for Application Programming Interface. It is also an interface. Um, they might incorporate Jupyter's and D3 notebook views for scholars to explore these APIs, to use the text and tweak it as they will. And that stresses a meta-argument. The editor's own argument belongs solidly, solidly in the constitution of the data and the access to that data, and has no place interfering in how the user chooses to read the text. 
And so the possible interfaces for a scholarly edition differ, sometimes radically, even if they're all expressions of the same underlying model. The situatedness of the scholarship involved causes them to differ. Scholarly argument, aesthetics, human-computer interaction, and usability all contribute to complicate matters in their respect sometimes more than they help. So we realize that we're leaving this, we're leaving our, our discussion at a rather annoying point. User interfaces are a means of communication of a scholarly argument. The decisions that go into their design are informed by the message or messages that the editor wishes to convey about the text. User interface design is a language that must be learned well in order to be used, to use effectively. You thought it was bad enough that you had to learn to code, now you have to learn user interface design. Um, the creator of a digital edition must understand that language, but we have as yet no grammar books or lexicons or, um, or code academy websites uh, for this mysterious, mostly nonverbal language. The alternative, however, is worse. If we agree that editors need not concern themselves with the skills necessary to make a good user interface, we're saying that the scholarly argument of their edition can be reduced to the ticking of boxes. And to consider an even worse approach, to advocate for the development of a standard user interface for digital editions, is to claim that all textual scholarship is fundamentally the same. And so we advocate instead, not for a set of guidelines or requirements for digital scholarly editions or their interfaces, but rather that each editor explicitly consider the semiotic significance of whatever interface element they provide to reflect on what aspect of the argument it expresses, how this element is adding or perhaps subtracting from the argument they wish to make. Thank you very much. <laughs>